Here to discuss the future of American conservatism, please welcome the Bulwark's Tim Miller, Sarah Longwell, and Bill Crystal. Here to lead the conversation is Atlantic contributor Evan Smith. Like this. How you doing? Yeah. Hear us okay? Yeah. Great. Good afternoon, you three. Good to be with all of you. Again. Good to be hey. with you. Thank you. Feels like we just did this. Feels like we did just, because we did just do this in Austin. But here we are in DC, and I want to ask you on the subject of our panel, Sarah, to begin, the future of American conservatism, what is the difference between being a Republican these days and being a conservative these days? I really thought you were going to ask Phil that question. No, I'm going to um, ask you first. OK. Uh, I think there used to be more of a difference between republicanism and conservatism. Republicanism was sort of the practical vessel through which many conservative things could be realized. However, today, conservatism has lost all meaning. And just like being a Republican, it really only means one thing, which is fidelity to Donald Trump. That's in a nutshell. Bill's going to give a long no, philosophical no, answer right. in which that he talks about Straussian that was, that philosophy. Was, that, was so, yeah. that was so well said, I don't need to say anything. So that yeah. was great. Next, next, <laughs> next question. No, I want you to answer the same question. What, what do you think the difference is between Republicanism or between being a, a, a member of the party on the one hand and being faithful to conservative principles these days on the other? Yeah, I, I think Sarah's right. There's not a difference because conservatism, uh, you could either say it's lost all meaning or it's become a really um, unpleasant and I would say dangerous, uh, more than unpleasant really, uh, damaging and destructive version of conservatism. And there have been many, many conservatisms, obviously for 200 years, European conservatism, American conservatism, different branches of American conservatism. And uh, I, that there, I think, that's the ser a lot of conservatives complain, Trump's not really a conservative. And that's a fair complaint if you mean he's not Ronald Reagan, he's not George W. Bush, and so forth. But I think it's also the sadder and more, more worrisome truth about the future is that he has transformed American conservatism. And the future probably is, for a while at least, unfortunately, more like J.D. Vance, and that Trump going away personally is not going to change the embracing of nativism, of the re re resurgence of a kind of racism, uh, America first, isolationism. If you had told me growing up, I mean, I studied a little history, like we all did, America first, totally discredited, right? This thing that was started in 1940, after Hitler had invaded Poland, after the fall of France, after it was clear what was happening in Germany and in the German-occupied territories. That's when America First was started. It wasn't like a little bit of a mistake in the 30s where they were kind of, you know, hopeful, right? That's what it was. It was anti, it was pro-Hitler, basically, anti-British, keeping us out of the war. Trump embraced that in 2016, and I thought, he doesn't know anything, he doesn't even know what it is. And of course, when someone tells him what it is, he'll say, oh, I just used that term. But what I meant was just, we gotta take care of Americans first and give a more traditional version of a semi-respectable isolationism. But it turns out, weirdly, I don't know if he knew what he was doing, but someone knew what he was, the people who were advising him knew what they were doing. And Vance really is America first, and Project 2025, and the whole thing. And so my, my, worries, my worry is that stuff doesn't go away even if Trump loses this November. And just to add to that quickly, there's a reason that J.D. Vance identifies himself as part of the new right, because he is saying this is something different from what you know, traditional conservatism that I grew up uh, learning about from people like Bill, right? It was your three-legged stool of sort of social... Con this is always happens on these panels. Yeah. Right? I'd say it, it takes... Why don't you it, it like takes, being my mentor? Why about, don't you like it? It takes about four minutes for some... <laughs> some subtle way of conveying the fact that I... Tell us about Wendell decades, decades older than these yeah. two. You know? <laughs> Maybe centuries almost, you know? <laughs> finish, please just finish. Tell me if please I get, finish. Tell me if I get the three-legged stool right, no, okay. Professor. Uh, so the, uh, right, of, of, of social conservatism, of muscular foreign policy, uh, and of economic conservatism, right, free markets. But free markets, limited government, American leadership in the world, like, that is antithetical to the current version of the Republican Party. So if conservatism is a specific thing, as it yeah. used to be, it used to have a real definition, it probably still is those things. But nobody is talking about that. That's not what people mean today when right. they talk about the conservative movement or whether Trump is a conservative or not. Uh, Tim, let me quote uh, Bill from the Bulwark earlier this week to get at this maybe from another side. Right. Bill was writing about J.D. Vance and the decision of uh, the former president to pick J.D. Vance as his running mate. He said, Trump thought Vance would help ensure his plans for a full-on radical and authoritarian presidency in 2025 weren't derailed by excessively law-abiding, norms-following, institutions-respecting, 
old-fashioned Republicans. The Republican Party that you and I grew up observing from a distance and from up close, they believed in the rule of law. They believed in norms. They believed in respecting institutions. That, it seems to me, to be one big difference today, right? Uh, yeah, uh, it, is, it is a big difference. And it was a intentional move to pick J.D. Vance. I just think to highlight what Bill is saying, yeah. and it was as part of, it's, it's tough to exactly know how much is part of their kind of deranged paranoia and how much of it was like a really intentional choice because I, I, it's been reported at this point that Tucker Carlson called Trump and told Trump that if he picks somebody that cares more about the traditional conservative, uh, you know, sort of rule of law elements like Marco Rubio, that, that the deep state will off him. So that's what Tucker said to Trump. That, like the deep state will push him out because they will put, they will see that they have a neocon vice president that they can yep. install and give them all this not whatever they want. So like whether or not like Trump and Tucker really believe that like conspiracy or whether like just they're sort of swimming in this conspiratorial soup and that was just like part of a rationale that's like maybe exaggerated but like you know uh, informed why he wanted to pick J.D. Vance as opposed to somebody like Doug Burgum or Tim Scott or Mark Rubio. Doesn't like really matter. I guess it kind of matters whether the next president of the United States is totally delusional or not but um, <laughs> as far as like the future of the party is concerned it does, it's kind of a distinction without a difference and they intentionally chose J.D. Vance because they knew he would go along with the program even if the program was outside, coloring outside the lines. Well, and they've, and, they've, and they've allowed him, and I guess encouraged him, to continue on, to articulate that program, to do so in an unbelievably demagogic and really terrible way, I think, in terms of Springfield, Ohio, and the Haitians and all that. And they've not pulled him back. And my impression is they're not even trying much to pull him back. Is it tomorrow night or two nights from now that J.D. Vance is joining Tucker Carlson in, somewhere in Pennsylvania, Hershey, Pennsylvania, I think, on Tucker Carlson's you know, tour of the U.S., having different guests. This is Tucker Carlson, who, what, two weeks ago, had a, a Holocaust denier. I mean, there's no other way to say it. A genuine Holocaust denier, honest as guest, gave the guy a huge boost. Tim was telling me before, right, that his podcast went from, you know, number whatever, 200 to number five or something for a week in the U.S. So a lot of people got exposed to this terrible uh, denial of truth and of history and uh, because of Tucker Carlson. And a few people said, you know, maybe the vice presidential candidate of one of the two major parties in the U.S. shouldn't be appearing with Tucker Carlson right after he's not just had him on as a guest, but praised this Holocaust denial, denying sort of popular historian. But I've seen no sign that there's any sense in the Trump campaign that it's a problem or that maybe Vance should find another, you know, place to go that night or something like that. So they are, I mean, the degree to which they're all in on that form of new rightism I think is sort of underestimated. Everyone sees the goofiness of Trump and the, you know, and all the kind of silliness and the lying and all, but the degree to which they now have a pretty big cadre of elected officials, operatives, donors who are in all in for America First and Project 2025 and its different offshoots yep. is pretty striking. Which I'll just say, we get we take criticism as never Trumpers. People are like, well, you abandoned your principles. And you right, say, you're a bunch of rhinos. Yeah, sure. Hear it all the time, right? Uh, proud, proudly. Um, but the thing is, is like, well, which, which, I mean, the free markets, Donald Trump's biggest economic plan is tariffs. Uh, American leadership in the world, I mean, they're going to abandon Ukraine, yeah. offer it up to Russia. Uh, like, character mattering, that was a big thing when I was growing up. When character was king is the you know, um, Reagan speechwriter, Peggy Noonan, that was her book. The Five Virtues, Bill Bennett. Like, all of this stuff we were steeped in, it's gone. Like, Trump right. has obliterated it. So uh, the idea that, that we, we get some of that, like, we need to support Trump for his policies. or we, Like, what are the, they're, the idea, they're like huffing Reagan's ghost. Some of these, uh, <laughs> some of these Republicans who tell, like, want to tell you to stay on board. Like, it doesn't even resemble Reaganism. Well, in fact, Dave, uh, Tim, this week David French said that the Reagan Republican Party is dead. I mean, we, 100%. you know, we'll, we'll talk occasionally about in Texas, at least where I live, could George W. Bush get through a Republican primary these days? Probably not. I don't know that Ronald Reagan not. could get through a Republican primary these days, <laughs> right? Well, no, I mean, George W. Bush's nephew, George P. dropped. Pride is I, went, I, went, right. I flew down to Austin, I talked to George before he did that. Like, you do not have a chance to win a primary in this party. Was that me? Uh, you don't have a chance to win a primary in this party. Like, I'm sorry, like you're a Bush and you're a Hispanic Bush at that. And you, and you really should think about challenging Ken Paxton as an independent or maybe even running as a right. Democrat. This was George P. Bush running for yeah. attorney general against Paxton. then incumbent, still incumbent, Ken Paxton. Ken Paxton, right. right, a corrupt MAGA Republican. And he didn't, he got killed. And he pretended to like Trump and it didn't work. So 
Right. Uh, like that's what the party wants. And Bill and I were talking about this on the pod earlier this week. It's, you, we've seen the situation in Ohio with you have Mike DeWine, the 77-year-old, old-school center-right Republican, talking about the Haitian immigrants, talking about the value that immigration brings and the shining city on the hill, like all of those themes, right? How there's economic value and how there are also challenges. We need to care about the rule of law, like what a conservative would say about immigration my entire life. And then you have J.D. Vance, you know, doing his bigoted nonsense. Like, in two years, does anybody think that, uh, that when Mike Dwayne leaves, if someone runs in his mold and someone runs in J.D. Vance's mold, what do the Republican voters want? Like, they, every, I, I would love to be wrong, but like every sign for the last eight, nine, 10 years, maybe longer, points to the fact that the voters will want someone in the J.D. Vance mold. Yeah. And so the party ends up only being what but the voters of the party want, right? Like, you know, that you can say what you want about ideology or historical precedent, but all a party is is a group of people that get together and, like, decide who they want to represent them. And the Republican Party voters have decided that they want America First candidates. And even worse than that and creepier than that, like, they've decided that they like the people that are the most antisocial and deranged possible in every race. I, I'm sorry, it's funny, but it's like not really. And like Mark Robinson wins this primary. Mark Robinson, who the CNN story just came out about how he's like, he thinks he's a black Nazi or whatever and is a Holocaust denier and goes, brings a pizza into the back of the porn shop. And he's the weirdest possible person that you could imagine. He ran against this guy that's just like, Joe business guy. Like, I, I, you know, yeah, conservative. you can just imagine his name. It was just like a business guy from North Carolina, mm -hmm. went to the country club, and he killed him. It was like 80 to 20. And so, like, the Republican voters want the weirder, crazier, antisocial, anti-establishment person. And so they're attracting those types of people yeah. to run. Uh, Bill, this is the part of every conversation we have where I remind the young liberals in the audience who now love you. I've got a that, list. Do you, want me to, yeah, yeah. do you want me to go down my list of that, things to remind them about? That you were Dan Quayle's chief of staff, <laughs> right, back in the day. Dan Quayle's fine. You, you I were, mean, Dan Quayle. You did worse than that. Well, You'd I could take just, him today, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Well, Mike Pence called him, didn't he, on January 5th, 2021, to say, yeah. can I go along with this thing that Trump's professor me to do? And Quayle said, of course not. That's out of the question. Right. Quayle presided, I remember this day in January of 93, over the Senate, when he, they counted the votes in the normal way that one used to do, and announced the defeat of the Bush-Quayle ticket and the, and the election of Clinton and Gore. Yeah. So, yeah. so Quayle had his, you know, whatever you can think about some of the policy, you know, policies and whatever and limitations, but he, was, he believed in like, institutions and the rule of law. So, so my point is you were around then, you know yep. the Bush family very well, to Tim's point about Bush, George P, George W, and all that. When did Bush become a four-letter word in the conservative movement? Well, Tim worked for Jeb in 2015, 16, and, you know, it seemed like a plausible... <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait, we were talking about your past. No, I... <laughs> you know, I, we don't have that much Tim time left. Jason I think we need, we we'll need, the Tim, we need right. Tim's reminiscences of the Jeb Bush <laughs> Huntsman campaign. <laughs> we need Sarah's reminiscences of working as a very young person <laughs> who had just come <laughs> to Washington know. for Rick Santorum. My stuff's really not interesting. Not that no. interesting. My, stuff's, my stuff's too long. This now. is the part where we turn on each other. <laughs> <laughs> Go. A absolutely good. So, so w w what happened? Where, where did the word I mean, turn I, within the... Well, I mean, it's one can... Looking back, as always is the case, I think, in history, you see all kinds of things that you kind of didn't want to see or papered over a little bit from 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 25 years ago even, things that we thought we had defeated or we wished we to have defeated and we didn't defeat as thoroughly as we did. On the other hand, to be fair, Buchanan took a shot at everything in, in the, at the presidency in 92 and 96. He had a little, you know, my, my, some success temporarily. And then he lost. He left the party by 99, 2000. I remember thinking that. And George right. W. Bush was nominated. The, the final two candidates in 2000, a, can, a campaign I was somewhat, I was editing a magazine, but I was sort of involved in as so I was close to McCain, were Bush and McCain. They were the final two. It wasn't even a, a right, it wasn't right, even Alan a, Keyes. Yeah, or Alan or, Keyes, or, or, Gary or, Bauer, yeah. those guys went nowhere. So, and anyway, so, uh, you know, so that as recently as 2000. And then, of course, the nom the, the ticket in 2012 was Romney, Paul Ryan, which is not quite the same uh, as what we now have. So I, I, it's hard to know if you rerun history, if Trump doesn't get lucky in some yeah. of his opponents, if it's not a splintered field, if 2015 isn't a very rough year in terms of terrorism and migration, and especially the, the crisis in Europe, which had a weird effect over here, I think. I don't know, maybe history's different, you know, but, but, uh, but the stuff was there more than we wanted to realize, I think it's fair to say. The race in particular for me, I really thought, I mean, I guess I wanted to think this, and people can say, you know, Colin Powell, Condi Rice, 
George W. Bush going out of his way to go to a mosque a week after 9-11. I thought, yeah, this is not the Republican Party that my parents didn't want to be part of in the 50s and 60s, but there was still too much of that, right? And they were kind of old-fashioned Cold War liberals in New York. But it turns out, I don't know, I guess historians will say that was an interlude or that was a cover, in a way, over a lot of other stuff that was lurking there. Yeah. Trump is also, it's one last one, is, is a good, de is an effective demagogue, though. I'm not sure anyone, Buchanan didn't make it work, right? I mean, other people didn't. Trump's a weird mix of willing to play the most vulgar and destructive and bigoted kind of cards, but combined with the New York con man, you know. Celebrity. Celebrity, celebrity. 24 years, 14 years on that show, successful businessman, that whole <laughs> shtick. And, he, and it's a very unusual combination when you think about it. Your typical right-wing demagogue is a bitter guy who's been a bitter guy for 30 years and is not a successful salesman. And whatever you think of Trump, right, he's had a career of figuring out what people wanted in a way and conning them a lot of the time, but also speaking to what they wanted. So I think Trump, unfortunately, was, was better at this than one thought he would be. Sarah, you three on this stage are all voting for Kamala Harris in this election. You're doing it un unambivalently. Enthusiastically, <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to I want to understand I want to understand a little bit about that and push at that. So you're doing it unambivalently and urgently despite the fact that you were lifelong Republicans, you were lifelong conservatives, you've made the decision that this must ha happen. Is this you playing defense or playing offense? Are you voting against him full stop? Or is it a mix of voting against him and seeing that she actually is the more conservative choice? I don't know about the, well, yeah. No, I mean, she is the more conservative choice if you're talking about first principles. And first principles right. are about, are they gonna abide by the Constitution? Do we have a peaceful transfer of power? Those are pretty conservative principles. Robust, <laughs> ro ro uh, right. Yeah. Ro robust foreign policy. That's, that, right. I mean, ro it ro that doesn't have to be that robust. Let's like, just defend our democratic allies abroad. I mean, yeah. look, the thing about, at the, the, the nub sort of of the question you're asking is like, so what does it mean to be a conservative? Being a conservative was about conserving what was good, yeah. right? That is it as it, and that's why conservatives and progressives oftentimes are this way because progressives are saying, no, we gotta forge ahead, we gotta break things, we gotta, you know, we gotta change everything. And conservatives are like, no, there's so much here that's good. Well, Donald Trump is a burn it all down, uh, you know, demagogue, and J.D. Vance is the kind of person who looks at Trump, and Tucker Carlson's the kind of person who looks at Trump and says, this guy's breaking everything. And in him breaking everything, there creates crevices and places for us to move as people who are more ideological and build new things uh, more in our image. Because Trump doesn't really care about most things, but you know, J.D. Vance has something more like an ideological project, people like Peter Thiel. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but it has nothing to do with conserving what is good, least of which, is like the basics of the American experiment. And you can hear this in the rhetoric. So it's not that I think Kamala's steeped in conservati conservatism, but what she does do is not only have a reverence uh, for things like the peaceful transfer of power and saying we're gonna defend our democratic allies abroad, but she's also sort of inviting conservatives in, saying you can be part of this coalition because I'm gonna respect the higher principles, yeah. whereas Donald Trump makes no has no such interest in doing that. Uh, Tim, after the convention, I noted that you wrote about her speech. Yeah. Tell me how this would have been different if Condi Rice had given it. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, so there were no lines about bomb in Iran, so maybe there was that one difference, but like besides that, I, honestly, I, I mean, she made an effort, right? And again, I'm not out there saying that she would be the third, like the McCain term I never got in 2008 or anything. Like, she's not gonna be, right? I mean, she's a California liberal. And but like, that's okay. And, and she is demonstrating she has a respect at least for the themes and the values that were the optimistic part of the conservatism that, of the conservatism that I grew up in. And, and that's good enough, right? And, and I think that she talked about that in, in foreign affairs in particular. I think that she was really strong in particular on, on foreign policy. She talked about it, about all that stuff that we heard in the 80s and 90s the shining city on the hill and, and pluralism and how, this, and how that her and Tim Walls as two middle class people from different backgrounds are the best of this country and no matter what language your grandparents speak, like you're all part of this country. Like that's all the stuff that I was steeped in. So like thematically and values wise, uh, she's a million times closer than yeah. Donald Trump is. In, in the uh, true uh, way of the bulwark, 
uh, Bill, she is sort of the country over party candidate, isn't she, for folks like you? Yeah, and she tried to make that clear at the convention. I mean, who's spoken the, the hour before the actual presidential acceptance speech is the second best hour to feature candidates. They all kill, you know, everyone will kill to get into that right. prime time with the highest viewership. Who did she have speak? She had Adam Kinzinger speak, a Republican, which, you know, we now take that for granted. But that was, she, a lot of Democrats were annoyed that Adam Kinzinger, who only saw the light really in 2021, I mean, he's been great, don't get me wrong, but, you know, who supported Trump in 2016, nominally in 2020, but uh, annoyed that, why is he speaking there instead of me, who's been a loyal, you know, Democrat yep. for 20 years and was right about Trump from the beginning. He spoke, and then Leon Panetta. For me, that was very telling. Leon Panetta, someone reminded me of this yesterday, is, is I think he's 85 years old. He's in very good shape. He's a wonderful man. He's served the country extremely well in many jobs, Congress, Clinton's chief of staff, uh, Obama's CIA director, and then Secretary of Defense. Why, did, but he's not a current figure in Democratic Party politics, really, right? And I mean, half the people watching probably thought, well, who is this guy anyway? And she wanted to send a signal. Leon Panetta is a traditional, centrist, pretty tough-minded, moderate Democrat on foreign policy. And he gave a speech which was about Ukraine and about standing up with our allies. He quoted Ronald Reagan. I really thought maybe you know, I'd died and gone to heaven to see Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Ronald Reagan quoted by the penultimate speaker at a Democratic convention just before the, the nominee. It was even better in the debate when Kamala Harris herself at one point went out of her way, and it was pretty clear she had planned this and went out of her way to, to quote, just to, uh, to quote, quote, the late, great John McCain. So I thought, wow, what a Demo great Democratic Party campaign this is, you know? <laughs> Reagan, McCain. <laughs> so I, so I'm, pretty, I'm pretty comfortable there, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so we're 47 days out. I have to ask you guys, while we're together, what do you, th what do you think is going to happen? What is the trajectory of this race, given where we sit today? There have been a number of polls over the last couple of days, if you pay attention to this, that have been a little odd, beginning with the New York Times poll that had the popular vote tied but had Harris ahead four points in Pennsylvania, which seemed like the inverse of a lot of what we've been seeing, they even felt the need to write a story saying, yes, we know this is weird, right? <laughs> T Tim, what's going on here? And is it possible to even know what's going on here? 47 days out. What's wrong with this? I think the thing is, is that we you have... should button your shirt, uh, you know. Uh, sh I think people... there's like too much chest showing. The people want to see a little nip, I think. <laughs> um, oh wait, where's the Atlantic? <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, Jeff. I'm sorry, Jeff. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> We have a concerningly close race, is what we have. I, I mean, I think that, that uh, the vice president has a clear uh, but small lead across the swing states. She has more uh, more paths to victory. But all Donald Trump has to do is win the states he won in 2020, plus Georgia, or, and plus Georgia and Pennsylvania. And both of Georgia and Pennsylvania look very close. So I think of the remaining voters out there, the pool is bigger for Kamala. Like you can see, her trajectory is going the right direction. She's been adding people ever since the switch, um, shoring up the Democratic base first. If you look at the New York Times poll today, she was mostly showing up our people. It was college-educated whites, former Republicans, independents. Like, that's who she was doing better with. Um, and she still has more work to do with young uh, uh, black and brown men, mostly, um, to, be, to be frank about it. And, um, you know, I think that right now we have a very close race, but the Democrats have shown ever since 2016 that the anti-Trump coalition is bigger than the pro-Trump coalition, as long as you can get the coalition together. Sarah, you're the data person, right? You spend a lot of time doing focus groups. This is your thing. What, what are you looking for as signs on the road between here and there? Yeah, I mean, look, the, 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 we joke in our office all the time where we pour over every detail of everything, and then we all shrug our shoulders and go, well, it's going to come down to turnout. <laughs> uh, <laughs> both because that's true uh, and also a great cliche. Um, I think, though, the main thing that I'm looking for I've been watching uh, what we call flippers in the focus group. So people who voted for Trump in 16, voted for Biden in 2020. This was a group that had been backsliding away from Biden because they were frustrated about the economy and they were especially thought he was too old to do the job. Those people are slowly coming back to Harris, but here's what's interesting about them. They are out on Trump. They're out on Trump. And so their decision is either vote for Kamala Harris or leave it blank. And then there's other, this other big um, sort of undecided pool of voters isn't just, do I decide between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump? It's also, do I decide to go out and vote, right? Do I get up off the couch? That's a big part of the undecided vote. And I think that 
watching her energize people, like every indice that is not poll related that I think people don't see as much of, how many people are volunteering? Small dollar donations, how many of them are brand new donations? Those things all bode really well for her and I think at the end of the day, uh, these elections tend to be decided by both the turnout and then the late breaking independents. And I think the independents are gonna break, from her, break for her. Uh, Bill, the, the Cheneys two weeks ago when they announced first Liz and then on behalf of her father uh, uh, announced that they were both going to support the vice president, Liz Cheney made a point of saying it's not enough to simply not vote for him. This is urgent enough that you actually have to vote for her. So to the point about the people who are sitting right now on the fence deciding do I not vote or do I leave that blank on the one hand or vote for her? Liz Cheney's argument would be this is urgent enough that you've got to figure out a way to vote for her. I think she's right. I wish more people who had worked in the Trump administration and have said sometimes many times, sometimes to Jeffrey Goldberg in interviews on the record and on background before they went on the record probably, um, you know, that the guy is, should never be president again. They need to just step up and say, say that to the camera first of all. Because, no. And then say, and I think people should make up their own minds about who to vote for. I don't tell, you know, if they have matters of conscience, why they can't quite go for Vice President Harris, but most of them don't. And they just need to say, I'm voting for Kamala Harris. They don't need to give a big rationale. They don't need to give 10 minute speeches on, they just need to say, Donald Trump cannot be president. Kamala Harris is in the mainstream tradition of American politics. I'm voting for Harris. If they want to then say, but I kind of hope to be able to vote for Brian Kemp or Glenn Youngkin in 2020, 2028, that's fine, you know? So I think there are people who could do that who served with Trump, obviously, the John right. Kellys of the world, et cetera. And then there is this one guy who Dick Cheney worked for, who I think could still make it, could make a difference if he came out and just said, you know, I've never been for a Democrat in my whole life. He's probably literally true, right? His father was already prominent when he became a voting age. Uh, but George W. Bush really should say that he's voting for Kamala Harris. Uh, and with this last 10 seconds, yeah. uh, if George W. Bush or any of these people care about the future of conservatism, they should vote for Kamala Harris. Because if Donald Trump wins this election, it's over for any future Republican party that shares any relationship to the one that you grew up in. And so it shouldn't be a hard choice for you. And if you want to tell yourself you're doing this to preserve uh, the opportunity to have a Kemp or to have somebody like that, tell yourself that and do it. Okay. I think that's a good place to stop. Wait, hard to argue with that, Evan. All right, good. Uh, please give these guys a big hand. Thank you very much. All right.